Hey, welcome to On The Chain. This is Jeff, missing co-host Chip tonight. Um, He is out for the evening. Uh, It's actually his anniversary. So he won't be here with us tonight, but he will be back on Sunday. Tonight, though, we have got so much to go through. There are some updates, little bit, little tidbits of updates with the SEC v. Ripple, SEC v. XRP lawsuit. I want to dig in a little bit to that. There's also some interesting statements that have been coming out of the SEC chair Gensler. So want to talk about that. I want to play back some of the video. We want to analyze it a little bit. We want to kind of give some commentary of the SEC chair, some of the things he said. And Brian Brooks also had some really good statements uh, that we need to review from this week. So if you guys are ready, I'm ready, and we are going to kick this thing off. So let's go. Welcome to On the Chain. Hmm. All right. So for all those out there so far, why don't you guys just shout out where you guys are tuning in from? So it's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, we are going to go through this. We're try. We're going to try to hold back a little bit. You know how we don't like to express too much and get too passionate about things when we're here. So let's oh, You know what? I was getting ready to play it, and then I'd be enjoying it, and you guys wouldn't even see it, and I'd be the only one watching. So, <laughs> so let me add this up here. Let's go full screen. Um, we're not going to talk about you know who this uh, congressman or senator uh, is, but we are going to go. We're going to go to the questions, and we want to hear some of this feedback. And I just realized, let me stop the screen share. I forgot to hit the audio click. There we go. Click audio. Now we're ready. If you guys are ready, let's dig into this thing. Let's put this up on the screen. Here we go. Let's add it. We can go small. We can go large. Let's figure out how we go. Begin talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, We talk about mission of agencies, but the world is changing. In fact, you know, the world's changing in front of us while the scenery behind us changed. It seems sort of dizzying at times. You know, from a, a regulatory perspective, many cryptocurrencies are treated as commodities. But in practice, you know, they're characteristics of currency and securities. So uh, do you think, think the current regulatory categories are sufficient for oversight? Uh, and do you see value in the creation of a new regulatory category? All right, here we go. So. You can already feel a little bit the tone of the question. He's getting into kind of the problem. Uh, You can kind of see, you know, maybe you're thinking a little bit about get into his brain a little bit. What is the tone that he's trying to set with the line of questioning? And I think this is really important because once you get in front of Congress, once you get in front of committee, you know, everyone is going to have what they might have their preconceived notion. They might have their political agenda. You know, his hair is a little bit disheveled. You know, he's kind of uh, intent maybe on on his line of questioning. Um, And now we're getting ready to dig in. And so this is going to be interesting. This is going to be, you know, all telling here. Let's see, you know, how Gensler uh, is getting ready to, uh, to respond to this. Um, I thank you for that question, uh, Chairman. I think that there's gaps in our current system. Uh, You're right to say that there are many crypto tokens that do come under the securities laws and our agency is is, uh, uh, trying to enforce the laws, but there's thousands of tokens. Okay, hang on. Get ready for this. You guys got to pay attention. Let me backtrack this a little bit. Get ready for the comment that he has right here. Okay, so this is really, really important. You know, here's the guy that came from MIT, taught a course on blockchain. This is how everybody has really promoted him. They get super fired up, super excited that Gensler is coming in to take over the SEC. And then, and then what? So this, this is the then what that we're about to listen to. Now, I never put this guy up on the pedestal and said that he's going to be the end all be all that's going to be the savior of the digital asset space. But many did. 
And when you do, then you're subjected to a little bit of disappointment when it doesn't necessarily go the right way. Now, I never put myself in that position. I already looked at it from a perspective that, you know what? I don't really think that he's going to go up there. People are putting too much credence in what the outcome is going to be. You know, there was no real full expectation uh, that, you know, he is going to be that big savior. Hang on one second. Hey, what's going I'm on? I'm the big savior. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All over there someplace. I don't know. Go ahead. He's looking for pop chips. No, no, don't touch the camera. Do not touch the camera. No, no, stop. Go, go. I'm live. I'm live. Okay, go. <laughs> Holy cow. It's about to move the camera around. They're in there somewhere. <laughs> okay, I don't know. He's looking for a pop chip. Sorry about that. We got sidetracked in the middle of a live stream. So anyhow, all right, let's get into this. Let's let's go back into what he was saying. Ready? I think that there's gaps in our current system. Uh, you're right to say that there are many crypto tokens that do come under the securities laws and our agency is, is uh, uh, trying to enforce the laws, but there's thousands of tokens and we've only been able to bring 75 actions and there are others currently wait, wait, wait. non- Okay. <laughs> so so here we go. Like, <laughs> I, gotta, I, I don't want to back it up too far. Here we go. Here it goes again. That do come under the securities laws and our agency is, is uh, uh, trying to enforce the laws, but there's thousands of tokens and we've only been able to bring 75 actions. And there are Now, what in the world is he saying? There's thousands of tokens, but we've only been able to bring 75 actions. Now, if you have this idea that this guy came into this space to be pro- digital asset, then who and why would you come in and make a statement like that? If your intent is to drive and build this space, then what? You know, are you coming in here to uh, to drive and, and build the space when you say there's thousands, but we've only been able to bring action against 75? What does that mean? That means that their intent is to bring action against the thousands that are out there. Now, again, you know, everyone said, hey, with the SEC v. Ripple case, that this is the guy that is going to be the right one, you know, and, and Clayton is, is the bad guy. I honestly, you know, with Clayton in the space, we go back, how much negativity, you know, was there in the space? You know, there wasn't, you know, a significant amount of, uh, of negativity that was in the space, you know? So now though, we're starting to see, you know, this drive of maybe things aren't going to be as, as rosy as, as we think. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, time will tell, but let's, li let's listen. Others currently that are non-compliant, but I think the bigger gap is around what's called exchanges, crypto exchanges. And I, I, w I would think if we could work with Congress to try to bring investor protection to the platforms where these sometimes commodities, sometimes securities are trading on the platform. Now, it's interesting. You know, he references, he goes back and he references Congress. Now, the one thing that we know, regardless, regardless of what he wants to do, doesn't want to do, the SEC does not write legislation. The SEC can't make a determination as to whether or not, you know, what the you know, uh, clarity will be for the cryptocurrency space. The SEC can only act based on the rules that are on the books. So you now he brings up Congress. He said, maybe Congress can work with us. Now, they, the, the original senator or congressman, he asked him, what are the problems inherent in the space? Now he's going into this problem that's focused in on the exchanges. Now, in some way, you know, yes, you know, it does. It does make sense that, um, you know, that in some way it does make sense that we need to look out at the exchanges because there are certain things happening within the exchanges that could potentially take advantage of new investors. I mean, new investors in their entirety where they've never invested before, not in stock, and they come into the crypto space, and these exchanges are being 
uh, built as though, you know, uh, with, with all these different features. Now, the one thing with all these different features, like uh, margin trading and, and all of this. Now, if you want to go in margin trade, typically you have to qualify for the margin trade or you have to have an offset of X amount of dollars in your account in a regular stock, uh, stock, uh, stock account. Uh, but if you want to get into option trading, you have to qualify for options trading. And there's certain dynamics within the crypto space that are too readily available to people. Now, so from that perspective, he brings up, you know, this initiative, bring it through Congress, because it is Congress that is going to help write the laws to provide regulatory clarity. However, let's see, hang on. And for those watching, Chair, while you finish your answer on that, could you explain what your concerns are, what the abuses go. that can take place involving these new currencies? Well, uh, without a cop on the beat and some rules of the road, uh, then market participants can uh, front run your orders. If you okay, so he say so again. He comes back and he's saying. Well, what are the problems? What are what are the issues? How can the retail investor be taken advantage of? And there's all these other elements to where you could go in and say, okay, there's all these other things that they could take advantage of with you on. Um, but you know, his focus is really emphasizing exchanges, and he's talking about front loading. Now, there is some concern there. If you go to a Coinbase, not Coinbase Pro, but Coinbase or Uphold or some of these exchanges that are purely exchanges. You're just buying one, selling one. That's it. You're not able to set a limit order. You're not able to margin trade. You're not able to do anything like that. Now he's trying to lump all of them into one, which is a little uh, off-putting because he knows better. And really, you know, his focus, if everything is so bad, why are we only focused on what the exchanges can do? That's it, you know. But yet, there's thousands of, of companies out there that, and they've only been able to go after 75. Now, again, if you're looking at the front loading on the exchange, that kind of makes sense to me. That's like the one element, but that's not the whole problem in the space. You know, not everybody's trading on Coinbase Pro and putting in limit orders, and you know, and and you know, putting in their trailing stops and making sure they don't get taken advantage of. What he means by front loading is typically as you put your orders into the order book, as the pricing comes up at your target number, then those get booked. And there are certain rules in a stock exchange that they have to abide by to fulfill those orders. Now, what he's referencing by front loading means that you know they're going to pick and choose which orders get filled to a point where you might have limit orders or uh, you might have trailing stops or stops or whatever that could prevent your losses and they might not take your orders or they might you know fulfill your order and close you out of your stop so that's what he's saying but there's already rules against fraud you know at the end of the day fraud is fraud and i and i've been going through this there's another article we'll get to that article in a second you know and it, you know in the article you know they're singling out you know specifics on and let me get rid of this we don't need to listen to him anymore but Let's see here. Here's the article. So this goes back to, let me put this up. So hang on. There we go. So the SEC chair says Americans need a cop on the beat to protect investors from crypto fraud. Now I get it. You know, there's certain rules of the road within every sp uh, specific market. Uh, there's certain rules of the road in the stock market. There's, you know, you have the insurance industry. There's real estate. There's whatever. I mean, the, the industries keep growing and growing and growing. You could go to all of them. Fraud is fraud. And what they're trying to claim here is that they want to protect investors from fraud. But in order to do that, we need a cop on the beat. Now, the one thing that he says that I agree with is that we need rules of the road because right now there are no rules of the road. It says arbitrary, no regulatory clarity, kind of uh, up in the air, kind of subjected to the whims of the SEC because the SEC can go after Ripple after seven, eight years and they can you know, come up with all sorts of, you know, I, I don't want to say crazy ideas, but we'll get into XRP and Ripple in a minute uh, with what's going on with the SEC. But this is what happens. 
a case like SEC v. Ripple is exactly what happens when you are lacking regulatory clarity. Now, in order to get regulatory clarity, and we talk about this almost every night, in order to get regulatory clarity, it has to go through Congress. You need things like the Token Taxonomy Act. I feel like it's a broken record you know, when we go over these things because it always goes back to that. It's always going to go back to when is Congress going to get on board and provide regulatory clarity so that those within the SEC, Gensler and those within the CFTC and those at the FTC and those, uh, you know, all over the place, they can get their act together um, and actually make decisions based on the true regulatory clarity, you know, and, and that's where this is what we need to do, you know. So here we go. So anyhow, SEC chair says Americans need a cop on the beat to protect against fraud. Um, let's see, he said there were gaps in the regulation of crypto like Bitcoin, BTC, USD, and Ethereum, noting that there are thousands. We heard them, right? So, you know, the, well, I think the person that's writing this singled out like Bitcoin and Ethereum. I didn't hear him say that. I heard him say thousands, and they've taken only been able to bring 75 actions. Um, I guess I'm not sharing this. I thought I was sharing this. What happened? There we go. So again, he says here, the most pressing issue is the lack of oversight. This is the most pressing. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe not. Because if there's rules and you have the exchange has to meet certain obligations, then isn't, again, fraud is fraud. Hold them to account based on fraud. So anyhow, you know, I don't know. It really gets me going when we go through this. But um, you know who also, you know, uh, would probably, you know, get super fired up, you know, about stuff like this. I'll tell you who. Come on, man. Berserker. 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 That's who. What is up, Berserker? Welcome. Good to see you on. Good to see everybody on. We've got 330 people here. Why don't we... Uh, throw in again. We did it earlier on, but as you come in, why don't you shout out where you guys are tuning in from? That would be awesome. So, all right. Let's see here. <laughs> Let's see. We've got uh, G Pops. He said Gensler was a regular guy when he taught at MIT on crypto. Uh, he's very pro XRP. And then by, and then uh, he reminds up, uh, what is that? TBH. What is that, by the way? No, that's TV. He reminds me of teachers I've had all on YouTube. Uh, so anyhow, so here we go. What we got in here? We got Canada, Scotland, Oregon. Got some South Florida here. Sweet. And there we go. Got XRP Scotland. Chip, it's his anniversary tonight. So uh, he is not in here with us tonight. So Fresno College, nice. All right, Flair. Who's got your Flair? What are they doing with Flair tonight? Anyhow, all right, where, uh, where else do we go? And here's another one. All right, let's put this one up. Let's continue down the Gensler path. Broward County. Look at that. Tristan Hodler, what's going on? All right, where were we? All right, so DeFi raises challenges for investors, regulators. Uh, so he, you know, he suggested that we need a dedicated market regulator. It says here, offer some protection against fraud and manipulation. Now, yes, we do need to protect investors against fraud and manipulation within the exchanges. Now, the one thing that I have seen is that multiple exchanges that have been taking advantage of investors have been shut down. Now in the DeFi space, you know, there are certain assets out there that do take advantage. And that's one of the dangers of being in the DeFi space. And people need to be very, very uh, observant and very, uh, you know, um, cognizant of 
all the different things that go around you. It's like going out, you know, at midnight down a dark street and, you know, looking, putting your headphones on and looking at your phone without paying attention to what's going on around you. Um, it's the same thing. You go on an exchange and you're investing your money. Just imagine you're down on a, on some deserted street in a place you don't know, and it's late at night, nobody's around and you want to be cognizant of your surroundings. You want to make sure that you know everything, you know, that someone's not going to sneak up on you. You're not going to walk around with your phone blinding your eyes. So you can't be observant if someone's going to come out of an alley at you. You're not going to walk around with your headphones blaring music so you don't hear if someone's coming up behind you. Now, why would you put yourself at that same kind of risk by going on to some of these exchanges and letting them take advantage? And there is some concern with some of these exchanges, but most of them aren't even in the US. So how do you regulate an exchange that's in another country or some of these assets are on exchanges that you wanna get into some of the meme coins? But then if from this perspective, yes, the exchanges have to go through some sort of regulatory process. Almost all the exchanges operating in the US have already gone through some regulatory process. Uphold. Gemini, Coinbase, uh, I don't know, the, the list goes on and on. Binance US, um, you know, now we've got Bitstamp, going, it's going to expand more in the US market. I mean, there's a whole host of exchanges in the US that have had to go through some sort of regulatory uh, process. They all have to abide by AML and uh, KYC in this whole process. It's anti-money laundering and know your customer. They are subjected to much of the same uh, regulation that other exchanges go through. Hence, some of the platforms can't work in New York, in New York State, because they've had to go through this process. Now, if you're going to put a cop on the beat because you're worried about fraud, these exchanges have already gone through the process. The fraud that he's referencing is many times coming from outside actors, or we saw fraud in Turkey. We saw fraud in, uh, in India. We've seen some, you know, we saw people in the U S that ran away with money, but they went through that original, that was early on. They went through that original process and then they get caught, but you have to invest and you have to be smart about it. You know, now the goal of the sec is to then hold these companies accountable for what they say they're doing. That's it. Now, we're not talking about overzealous, the overreach of a government that's trying to shut down these exchanges. We're talking about give some guidance, some rule of the road. And then, you know, do you really need uh, more cops on the beat? One thing that has been brought up is maybe, maybe we do need a specific department within government, another government body that can be packed, filled with more of these, uh, you know, uh, these individuals that may or may not be working because maybe they don't have an incentive uh, to do the right thing. And they're just there to get their paycheck and their three months of vacation and you know their cush government pensions and all that other stuff. Do we really need another government agency to oversee this? Doesn't it fall within the SEC, the CFTC, uh, the FTC, uh, FinCEN, and the list goes on and on and on and on of how many organizations are already out there that can already provide some regulation. And like Darren says, no more government. It's the last thing we need. We don't need another government agency. We don't need it. Definitely don't need it. And we definitely don't need a cop on the beat because this guy's responsible for his stuff. The FTC and the, and the CFTC are responsible for theirs. FinCEN is responsible for their. Everyone has a part to play, right? The comptroller of the currency of the OCC has a, ro a role to play. Everybody has a role to play. We don't need another role. There's another asset class. You don't have an agency overseeing uh, derivatives or you don't have an agency over overseeing uh, metals, precious metals or gemstones, you know, they're, they're all going to, all these companies are going to fall within the same framework. All it is another asset. That's what it is. So 
Anyway, I keep looking over at this article. It's driving me crazy. Let's uh, let's sidetrack. Let's go over to Brian Brooks because we like Brian Brooks. Now he's over at uh, Binance US. What do you guys think of that? So, what's up, Berserker? Clanking beers with DeSantis. That's uh, the next person we need to get on here. Need to get in front of DeSantis. So I'm going through the ranks. And we'll have DeSantis on here. That's my objective. We might have to start with the mayor of Miami, talk to him a little bit. Um, need to get to Darren Soto, get him on here. Kind of got all the different congressional representatives that we want to get on the chain. We had Warren Davidson on here. He was awesome. Darren Soto, Tom Emmer, Ted Budd, all the players in the space. Uh, the mayor of Miami is doing some unique things. Need to get to the governor of Florida and truly find out how we can make you know Florida a crypto safe state, just like Wyoming, just like Idaho. You know those guys, they're like, hey, we're gonna create this safe space like in Wyoming where you want to come here. It's crypto friendly. It's blockchain friendly. We're into the innovation of everything. You want to open up a bank here, come over here and open up the bank. So tons of stuff. Expat Explorer, we need Jeff on the SEC board. Oh yeah, we do. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was at a board meeting right before this started. And finally, we're supposed to have a hard cutoff of, of eight o'clock. And then finally, they hadn't made a decision uh, by eight o'clock. And I said, that's it, guys. I'm out. I got to leave. And I just hung up. I was on, we we're on the Zoom. I don't know how many people were in the board meeting and I just had to leave. That was it. Done. Done and over with. So anyhow, all right. Oh, forgot to, forgot to add this. Let's put this up here. Here we go. So Brian Brooks, let's see what he has to say. Look at all these people in here. Everyone's got a different background. Looking nice with the background of the coin desk and the bookshelf. And all right. Anyhow, let's go. US, they're more of a discussion than a reality, to be quite honest. I, I gave a talk. Wait, start over again. Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I think in the US, they're more of a discussion than a reality, to be quite honest. I, I gave a talk yesterday. There was a poll asked about. So he's talking about CBDCs, right? Central bank digital currencies or more to the point, a digital dollar. So let's see what he says. Hang on. The participants as to when they thought the US would launch a CBDC. Did they think it was going to be A, in 2022, B, 2023 to 25, C, never. Only 5% of the people said never, but I'm going to put my money on never as the uh, as the actual time. You know, that's just not what we do in this country is uh, have the government build innovative structures. Boom. That's that, that resonates. You want to hear some resonation? That resonates. The guy from the OCC, now CEO of Binance US, just went, he just doubled down and said, the US CBDCs, never, never. That's, he just doubled down with that. The US not going to launch a digital dollar because not that's not who we are. We don't have, the government isn't innovative. They're not an innovator. They don't, they don't build and develop the technology. So let's hear that one more time. Hang on a second. Let's hear that one more time. Well, you know, I, I think in the U.S., they're more of a discussion than a reality, to be quite honest. I, I gave a talk yesterday. There was a poll asked of all the participants as to when they thought the U.S. would launch a CBDC. Did they think it was going to be A, in 2022, B, 2023 to 25, C, never? Only 5% of the people said never, but I'm going to put my money on never as the uh, as the actual time. You know, that's just not what we do in this country is uh, have the government build innovative structures. There you go. There you go. I, I mean, I don't know what else to tell you guys. That is, you know, point blank, you know, the best information that we've had, you know, from, from anywhere. You know, so you have the guys that are in government right now. They're over there. They're working. They're doing their things. You know, they're making their deals. Um, they're not providing the regulatory clarity that we need. And here's a guy who was head of uh, OCC and, and look at him now. Never. Not going to happen. Now, if it does happen and we do have these digital assets, then, hey, you know what? 
Uh, we're going to have the ripple net. We're going to have the ripple net rails to move the CBDCs. Now in the US, we're not going to need it. You know, it's going to be interesting. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a follow up. Okay, then if never, then then what? It's not coming from the government. You know, they're, it, they're not going to innovate it. They're not the ones that are going to develop it. So now you turn and you say, okay, but you have all these other great digital assets. You've got an asset that you have a ledger, you have the XRPL, you have the XRP ledger, this technology that's amazing, that has the uh, the 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 foreign exchange, the exchange does it could be fiat, could be crypto, it doesn't matter. It's all baked into it. It has this great mechanism of moving money. And then there's this company that said, hey, you know what? We're going to take on Swift. We're going to provide a better mousetrap. We're going to provide a better messaging solution. Swift around since 1974. Ripple around since 2012. In the few short years that Ripple has been around, they have built and designed a phenomenal solution that outshines and outdoes what Swift can offer because Swift is just messaging. Ripple had that the messaging component in RippleNet. Then they added ODL, the on-demand liquidity that moves money and it can handle, guess what? It can handle CBDCs. Guess what? It can handle a digital yuan. It can handle a digital euro. It can handle a digital Canadian dollar. It can handle all of them because all of those digital representations of money are just that. They're centralized, controlled government currency. There's no difference between that currency and a fiat other than now it's strictly in, in digital form. And by the way, they can also program it. They can adjust it. They can do what they want with it. You know, I like this guy. You know, I, I really do. And then you say, hey, why did Binance hire him? Because the guy, the guy knows what he's doing. The guy knows what he's talking about. And it's awesome to see. You know, it really is. It's good to see that you got someone with their head screwed on tight, you know, and he's all about innovation. He said that in the US, we don't crush private innovation. We don't crush that. And then you have the, the opposite side of it. You have all these entities running around in government right now that are the exact opposite that are promoting Marxism, socialism. They're promoting that the government is going to bail you out and help you and provide for you. And that the that private industry isn't good. That's the, the education that is prevalent right now in the current administration and the current political dealings. Super detrimental. It's destructive. Brian Brooks gets it. He understands that it's the private industry that brings about innovation. Without private industry, you have nothing. The government is never going to innovate. We already see the problem with government. And someone said, no, please, not another government agency. We don't want another bureaucracy. We don't want another bureaucrat that is going to oversee uh, the digital asset space. We don't need it. We don't want it. And there you go. So, all right, let's move on because the space keeps getting better. It's just like, you know, every every bit of news, it's just like gets better and better, right? Billionaire, Carl Icahn, eyes potential $1.5 billion crypto investment. It's awesome. He's looking at it. These guys live in a different world. He's putting in $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion. What's up, Darcy? Darcy coming into us here from uh, Galway. What's up? So, man, so we've got all these billionaires getting into the digital asset space, putting their money into Bitcoin, putting their money into cryptocurrency. They're going with that, the first mover advantage. But, man, this is, it's awesome. Look at this. U.S. billionaire, one-time crypto skeptic. Why? Because he sees Michael Saylor made three, four billion dollars. He sees what Elon Musk is doing. He's seen so many of these guys are starting to get it, right? And they're putting their money out there. And we saw what Michael Saylor's CFO uh, even said. He said, you know, 
I forget his exact comment, but he's basically said you're doing your company a disservice by not putting a percentage of your money into cryptocurrency. And he probably said Bitcoin. But in this case, look at this. The activist investor said he's looking at investing in crypto in a relatively big way. Relatively, it's relative for everybody, right? But big could mean a billion dollars, billion and a half. That's massive. I mean, it's awesome. You know, you got to love it because, you know, it, it means it. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the whole business. So the crypto industry is more than just digital asset. The crypto industry are all these other entities that revolve, you know, around the cryptocurrency space. So think about all the businesses, Coinbase. Coinbase revolves around it. Uphold. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. There's so many uh, that can actually provide a uh, return. So you don't necessarily always have to invest just strictly into the one digital asset. So I forgot to shout this out. Sorry about that XRP speedboat. I meant to put this up, but <laughs> he's, this is when we're talking about walking down a dark alley. And so, you know, when you're walking down those dark alleys, it happens pretty often, especially when you're when you're online and you happen to be sitting on one of the exchanges, right? And then you're sitting there late at night, maybe around midnight, like we're talking about. And you hear kind of out of the corner, you want to buy some XRP, right? <laughs> and then you're on the exchange and you're like, I was just checking. I was just logging in uh, to see what my, what my uh, crypto assets were doing. And then you hear that voice behind you, you want to buy some XRP? And then all of a sudden you find yourself and you're you're buying more. I think that's kind of how it happens, right? Speedboat. <laughs> Hang on, Tina Hall. What's up, Tina? Crypto rules and so does Jeff. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we're going to make some rules, some rules of the road. So Icon also said he believes crypto assets are here to stay in one form or another. Then he was pressed to see how much he would buy, how much he wants to invest. It's going to shut it down. So let's see if this is uh We got another sure. billionaire getting into crypto. No, eh, never mind. All right. So so that was cool. So that was uh, you know, we're we're seeing this trend though. The reason why I like, you know, you see him getting in, you see these billionaires, they're starting to move money. The big institutions moving money into the digital asset space because they know they know the direction that this space is moving in. And then we get over to uh, to what has been going on with uh, with the Ripple case, right? And so, let me see here. Hang on, I got to shut some of these tabs, and let's see if we can get there. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, let me put this Twitter up here. Because this is super relevant. We we're just talking about Ripple and Swift and and all that good stuff. So, so I am Legion said uh, you can see it as an incredible quick or incredible slow, depending on what time frame you think is reasonable. Um, I would say revolutionizing international finance is not something you would expect to happen overnight. I am Legion hit it right on point that. It's not going to just all of a sudden happen. It takes 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever that time period is to move this entire space to revolutionize international finance, because that's exactly what XRP and Ripple through the RippleNet initiative has been doing, revolutionizing the way money moves. It started with Bitcoin, then it started expanding. Right, we've talked about Ethereum. We've talked about smart contract and how that's so significant to the business space, which is exactly why Flare also is going to be critical, critical in the business space. Moving money, smart contract, DeFi, decentralized finance, decentralized. That means take it out of the hands of those that want to centralize it and control it and dictate the terms. He who controls it dictates it. Good night, Crypto Novice Kim. What's up? Let 
Meanwhile, where'd it go? I lost it. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, all right, well, let's scroll down here. Here we go. This is what I want to look at. People may feel like it's taking forever for Ripple XRP to become the global standard, like Katow said, but take a good look at Swift's history progress. That's right. We can look at somebody else put up this great. It was amazing. It was such a great tweet and I didn't capture it. I could have recreated it, but basically they looked at daily trade and the daily trade is hectic and, and real super erratic. And then you look at weekly trades, a little less erratic then monthly, a little less Then they looked at over a decade. And what do we see over a decade? Over a decade, it's just straight up, just straight. And it's, that's the decade, the full decade. So what did I lose XRP speedboat? Oh, I lost your uh, comment. Is that it? So check this out. All right. So I am Legion. Blockchain is the new norm, and Ripple XRP has overcome the legal hurdles. Overcoming. They're overcoming. There's significant legal legal hurdles. Once they overcome this, it's it's really it's significant. It's massive. So check this out. It took Swift 16 years to go from 239 banks in 1973 to 2,814 banks by 1989. So think about that time period. If you guys were around 1973 to 1989, I mean, you know, for me, that was, you know, a lifetime, you know, but take a look at this. But, you know, then it took Swift 47 years, 47 years to go from 239 banks in 73 to about 10,800 banks by 2020. So think about that growth. Think about where uh, Ripple is right now. And we look at this, go back to the founding of Swift, the original founding members, how many countries, how many members were involved because they were trying to streamline this whole thing. It's so significant because we're talking about 10 years total, you know, that this, that this whole thing has been, you know, building and, and growing. And with Ripple and with XRP and the XRP ledger, we're talking about a shorter period of time, you know, 2012. Man, I've already got a vote, Berserker, campaign manager. There you go. So, all right. So let's see where we go. Where do we go from here? I, I don't even know where to go from there. That's like, you know, it's like, that's a mic drop moment. Then we just uh, kind of end and walk away because, you know, all that stuff is is really important. So, all right, let's, let's do this. Now we've got Hester Pierce. Uh, speaking in her personal capacity, yet in front of the SEC sign. It always happens that they're sitting at the SEC. We know she's a commissioner of the SEC, but whenever she says something about digital assets, it's in her own personal capacity. Um, so as it has been with the others. So but let, let's take a look at this. Let's see if we can, uh, I don't want to cast it. Casting is not going to help any of us. Let's see if we can play it. Nope. All right. We can't play it. We're going straight to an ad. We don't want that. Let me remove that. Let me play it for a little bit. All right. Here we go. Eight seconds. It's so loud in my in my headset. I got to turn it down. I don't need my headset on except to listen to this. And then we'll uh, we'll really get into this. I'm expecting her to say something really, really significant. Okay. Here we go. All right, she's going to say something significant here. I can feel it. Look at the bottom line message I have is that we have to work to do, we have work to do in modernizing our custody rules all across the board. All right, now let's get into it. Let's see what she says. I think getting the, the verbiage right is, is, is. A what? We're not going to get it. She got the verbiage right. You got to get the verbiage start. right. Here you we should go. really be thinking about each type. Uh, never mind. All right, their platform, no good. Can't even uh, stream uh, stream what they're saying here. All right, let's take that off. Uh, let's move into something else. That's not going to work. Not going to work for us. Google Chrome, bad Google Chrome. I don't know. I keep opening. I've got all the other browsers, and I keep. 
going back to uh, to this Chrome nonsense. All right, let's get into uh, some other conversation here. So there was some commentary uh, earlier today that had to do with uh, uh, with the court. So so earlier today, right, the 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 uh, uh, the court grants uh, Ripple's motion for an extension of time to respond to the SEC's discovery. So this is the court, the judge. Now this was, uh, you know, there are a number of things up on Twitter about this, and it's interesting because the comment here was, and let me just read this: Court Court grants Ripple's motion for extension of time to respond to SEC's discovery motion, but then adds this statement: The parties are strongly urged to continue to meet and confer on these issues in an effort to resolve them without judicial intervention. So then I start looking at the commentary people responding to that. So people are looking at, are they settling? What does that mean? Um, what, what's the, uh, you know, what is the outcome of making a state, putting a statement out like that? Uh, there has to be something, you know, you put out a statement, you know, what, what's the next step? You know, what's the next step here? And it's interesting because I had to reach out. I had to reach out to a friend of mine. I picked up the phone. I said, you know what? I got to figure this out. I got to know what what they're referencing, and so we get into it. And he said, and here's the uh, the response. Basically, is that that statement from the judge? Now the judge is a little bit upset, you know, because the judge has been they've been a little she's a little bit upset uh, with uh, with the SEC uh, with well on multiple occasions. But in this scenario, basically saying you guys got to resolve this. But there's the reference the court was referencing an effort to resolve their discovery issues without court and in, uh, court intervention. So it had nothing to do with the main case. This is coming from a friend of mine. Um, and then we get into it, you know, so I get some more feedback uh, from another friend on all this stuff that's happening in the case, because we also saw that one of the head attorneys on the SEC side leaves the case, not only leaves the case, but leaves the SEC. Now, uh, there's more commentary on that. And people are saying, well, maybe the guy, you know, left. Why, why would he leave? You know, why is he, you know, why is he leaving? Uh, why is he leaving? Why is he leaving uh, the SEC at such a high point? You're leading this case. This is the most critical case in cryptocurrency history ever. Whatever the outcome is, is going to dictate the direction of the cryptocurrency space in the United States, which will also have a direct impact on what happens all over the world, because they're going to run off and do things on their own without any input or limited input, potentially, I don't know, uh, from the US. But the point there is, you know, the chance there, there's a high probability chance that the attorney left for his own reasons. I mean, that, that's a high probability. Maybe it was already planned, maybe not. Maybe it's family, maybe whatever. There's a whole host of reasons why he could have left. However, right, uh, this is coming from a friend of ours. Uh, he said, we can't ignore that the SEC has a relatively weak case. And they've also not handled it 100%, maybe the best way, right? So maybe he's actually leaving. This is just the theory. But maybe he's actually leaving because he doesn't want to be associated with the case, the outcome of the case. Because the SEC keeps kind of digging and making some mistakes, uh, you know, along the path of how they're going after uh, Ripple, and even how they then target and how they speak about uh, XRP investors in this space. It's more of a systemic issue within the SEC. Again, doesn't matter who's running the SEC at this point. Um, but the person running it, it's it's got their fingerprints all of it. Uh, this is Gensler's case. It's not Clayton's case. This is all Gensler's case at this point. There's not much he can do about it. The case has already started. He's he was put into he was basically thrown into the pit, and the lion is already there. They said he showed up. He had no idea what was you know. I mean, he knew there's a pit with a lion in it, and they said, hey, welcome. Boom, and they pushed him into the pit with a lion. Now he's in the pit. Thing is, he has no control over this now at this point. You know, it's all there's like a there's a gladiator already in the pit with the lion. And is he supposed to help the gladiator? Or is the gladiator 
going to fight it out with the lion. And he just has to sit on the sidelines and watch, you know, he, he can do some things, you know, but overall, you know, you guys get the point. So, um, you know, another part, you know, with, with all of this, you know, as we, as we really uh, dig in, I'm trying to find another, uh, another point here. Um, eh, no, no. Let me see. There was something else and now I can't find it here. Let me see. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. I had another great statement prepared and, and it's gone. It's not, it's not here in my, uh, in my keep notes. I don't know what happened to it. So let's go back up here. We got that one. All right, cool. All right. So do we need this? Nope. Don't need that anymore. Let me close. Oh, whoops. Okay. I can close out of that. All right. Let me pull this over. So we, we just talked about Carl Icahn. You know, we've talked about Michael Saylor. You know, we've talked about all these guys that are getting into the digital asset space right now. Right now, people are getting into, uh, you know, we're getting into this space, right? So Mark Cuban, oh, did I share it again? Here we go. So Mark Cuban is investing in Ethereum layer two Polygon. Now this is important. You know, Polygon is enabling a scaling essentially of Ethereum because their focus is on these high volatile gas prices. Uh, and you're seeing right now real world use cases that are springing up in order to fill in certain gaps within the digital asset space, within the blockchain space, whether it was from a Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or other solutions that needed to be solved, like moving money with the XRP ledger that's been around for a while in XRP and all these digital assets. But then you have others that are springing up. Look at Flare. Flare springs up to serve another purpose and it's it, it's creating interoperability between all these other assets within, within a smart contract type of environment that also then allows staking and all these other things to happen. So it's so amazing to see how this space is developing. Now, Mark Cuban looking at a product, a company that's going real world use. Obviously, we know Matic. Matic is just blowing up um, as DeFi, other product, all the other projects going live with Polygon, right? So Mark Cuban says, I was a Polygon user and find myself using it more and more. He said he's also integrating into lazy.com, a Cuban portfolio company that allows people to easily display NFTs. So we've spoken to many investors, but the discussion with Mark Cuban was truly mind blowing. Uh, that's uh, from Polygon co-founder. So another one, right? Another billionaire investing in the space. And then you have all these naysayers out there, or you looking at the market. I, I want a naysayer, we'll focus in on mass media, right? You get to the, the mainstream mass media that focus in so tightly on day-to-day, -day, even hourly action. We have 10 years of Bitcoin ramp up, 10 years of uh, less, let's say eight years of XRP ramp up, right? You've got all of these assets that are, are ramping up over the past eight, nine, 10 years, some shorter, massive in that period of time. And now you're starting to see, now you're getting the, the big money moving in, right? You're getting these big institutions, big institutional investors, big players in industries getting into cryptocurrency right now. And the media, again, is just focused on the ups and downs. This, this, this trajectory that has just been up, consistent up, and the media is focused on this. It's, it's amazing to me. So let's see, hang on. On the chain, Live Polygon has some of the biggest names in DeFi. That's right. It's it's huge. It's massive. And you see where it's going. I mean, the 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 numbers that uh Polygon and Matic have been putting up is phenomenal. Phenomenal. You know, it's just uh it's great to see. It really is good to see how this space is growing and developing. So, all right, what else do we got here? <clears throat> Let me take a quick look over here while we're going. Let me pull up. Uh, I meant to have it up already. 
Let me just pull up the coin gecko real quick. 541 in the stream right now. If you're brand new to On The Chain, why don't you guys hit that subscribe button? There's tons and tons of great content just like this. Hit that bell notifier, but we do stream six days a week, Sunday through Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I highly recommend that you guys subscribe. We get great guests on just like we had the uh, chief product officer from Helium. He was on this week. Uh, two weeks ago, we had Warren Davidson, Congressman Warren Davidson with us. Uh, we have, we've had CEOs on, you guys know, but if you're brand new, you've you know, Alex Mashinsky, CEO of Celsius. Uh, we had the CEO of Binance US. Uh, that was Catherine Cooley before uh, our buddy Brian Brooks that we need to get on the show as well. Uh, but anyhow, <clears throat> want to take a look at the numbers just to see where we're at and everything's red. Uh, <laughs> but I was looking, uh, Polkadot, yeah, like there's Polygon. Polygon's at two bucks. It was up to 220 yesterday and then went down a little bit. But anyhow, so you guys are outstanding. Uh, you guys really are outstanding for being on here with us, you know, late at night, every night. Um, I'll look forward to seeing all of you guys back on again Saturday morning. And if you guys check this out, <clears throat> check that out. Uh, XRP, I can't be 100% uh, percent sure, but I think it's magic. If you guys want a shirt like this, you guys can get that too at onthechain.shop. So if you go into our description uh, that's in our videos, um, and in this video specifically, you can actually uh, get a direct link uh, right over to the shop. And I'm gonna try to, uh, let me see if I can, uh, I just wanna copy and paste, make sure we get the right link here for you guys. I know it's in the description, but let's see if we can, uh, if we can grab the right one, let me make sure it's it's there and it works when I throw it in. But I highly recommend check out these cool shirts. There you go. That's it. And you guys can check out our podcast also. Uh, the podcast goes up uh, every single day we stream. So you can check that out on whatever platforms you want. Um, we'll be back on Sunday with a round table. I expect Chip to be back here in this seat with me, co-hosting. And I'll be back Saturday morning. And for those of you that are taking a long Memorial weekend, have a great one. And we will see you back right here on the chain on the next one. I'm out. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.